Hi, my name is Sharad Sharma. I'm one of the co-founders of iSpirit Foundation and a very warm welcome to this seventh volunteer open house session. Uh, we have a lot to cover in this session, so let me get started. Uh, many of you already know about iSpirit, so I don't need to tell you about that. If I just take you back the back in history a little bit, uh, this is a kind of a poster that we have from about 10 years ago. And uh, and this is uh, you know about rewriting the script of the nation. And uh, you know, this is this, if you go back in time, it sounded a little corny and perhaps even crazy. And 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 we laughed about it ourselves. We said, look, how can a bunch of volunteers really rewrite the script of the nation? And uh, but frankly, uh, you know. We thought it was not impossible, <laughs> and that's how, you know, uh, many of us in I Spirit kind of persisted. And today, I'm happy to share with you uh, that we can look back with some sense of satisfaction uh, that uh, yes, indeed, a small group of volunteers can rewrite the script of the nation. You know, some of the concepts that we have given birth to uh, and worked with many others to bring to life. Uh, are now part of the lexicon, part of the thinking, you know, part of, of our future uh, in a way that would have been impossible to imagine. Uh, India Stack is one of those things. You know, India Stack, as you know, mediates the flow of people, flow of money and flow of information. All of you know about that, so I'm not going to discuss that in detail. Some years ago, we introduced the concept of open networks, uh, we introduced Oaken first, Open Credit Enablement Network, and then Ocean, and then more recently, uh, ONDC, which is iSpirit supported, but not iSpirit, also came to life. So this combination of India Stack and Open Networks together is digital public infrastructure. And digital public infrastructure is really uh, part of the conversation worldwide. And why is that the case? Because you know, every 20, 30 years, we have this discussion whether this type of infrastructure, what is private and what is public, right? If you go back to 1981, this was a discussion that was happening for telecom networks and uh, British Telecom was born that year and it was envisaged as public infrastructure. AT&T was, however, private infrastructure, uh, you know, and then in 82, this issue was resolved with the Antitrust Act against AT&T, and then that gave birth to internet as public infrastructure. So, so, so now, so many years later, almost 40 years later, this conversation is live again, and this is about digital infrastructure. And our approach of saying that some minimal part of it, which is to do with flow of people, flow of money, and flow of information, should be public infrastructure, you know, has been noticed. And, and why has it been noticed? A, because it's been successful. And B, the way it has been done, although flow of people, digital identity is publicly provisioned public infrastructure, the flow of money, which is UPI, is privately provisioned public infrastructure. And the same is the case with DEPA and the account aggregator. So, so not only is, you know, is this very interesting uh, for people uh, you know, uh, as to how it's been done, uh, the fact that it is successful and the fact that there is deep thinking behind why something like this is needed for society uh, is, I think, a lasting contribution that many people in iSpirit uh, have, have made, uh, you know, for the future. So, but our journey is incomplete. You know, we could sit back and bask in this, uh, but the reason we don't do that and the reason we can't do that is because we have unfinished work to do. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us. Our mission is to make India a product nation. What does that mean? It means that we have a, a segment in the economy that creates products, not just for India, but perhaps for the world. You know, we want to be a France and not a Spain. We want to be a Korea and not a Thailand. You know, you can't name many Spanish brands, certainly not any product brands. But you can certainly do that with France. We buy their Airbus, we bought their Rafale, we bought their nuclear plants, they have submarines and much more, right? Same is the case with 
Thailand, you can't name any product brands from there, but Korea, you can. And so, so, so these two countries had very similar journey till a small group of people in those countries woke up and said, hey, no, we need to focus on changing the structure of our economy. And they did. And, and that's the group of people that we want to be. We want to be able to look back 10 years from now and say, hey, we made a difference in India becoming a product nation. So for that, the fact that we've had great success with DPI gives us confidence, gives us a sense that our basic approach of making it happen is correct. And we, if we stay the course, we will get to the future that we seek to create for ourselves uh, as Indians. And, and so what is that basic approach? And that basic approach is that we'll collaborate with lots of people. You know, we will see ourselves at 30 year architects. We are the people who will hold this change for a long period of time. And we can do that because we don't have any VC money. We have, you know, we are volunteers. We have patience. We have persistence. We have grit. We have stamina. And you know what? We have absolutely wonderful global talent. So, so, so that's something that we will hold on our own. But we'll also partner with others because without that partnering, things cannot happen. The actual ecosystem is shaped by policymakers, is shaped by VCs. We've ourselves introduced two new types of ecosystem players. These are two nonprofit ecosystem players. Uh, one of them, you know, illustration of that is MOSIP, you know, MOSIP has taken identity to 10 countries in triple IT by parking it in triple IT Bangalore. And you can, you know, it's already, I think, in about it's serving about 80 million or so people. You can check it out at mosip.io and uh, they have a dashboard, a live dashboard there. <clears throat> and we've also been creating self regulating organizations. And the most recent one that we created is Sahamati, and that's for the account aggregator. So these are nonprofits, and we hope to see many more DSOs come up and many more SROs come up, and, and we hope to engage more deeply with policymakers and VCs as we go forward. So they shape the environment uh, within which actually the private players innovate. And our, as many of you may have heard, our, our central tenet is that India's hard problems will be solved with private innovation and public infrastructure. So, so this is really uh, the journey that we are on. Uh, by virtue of being no greed and no glory. No greed allows us to partner with market players. And no glory allows us to partner with policymakers. We don't stand up and take credit for much of the stuff that we do. And, uh, and, and so, so that is the basic approach that's been validated now in the last 10 years. And it positions us very effectively to go after this unfinished agenda that we have and that agenda is of making India a product nation. So, so really in this context, you know, now if you see, you can probably appreciate why we have our busiest year ahead. This year, we will have more stuff happening than ever before in any, any previous year. There are six playgrounds that will see a lot of activity. And I'm not going to give you a lot of details because they'll be there in the latter part of this uh, uh, of this uh, session. Uh, but a very big change, and perhaps the most significant one that is coming is to do with the training cycle. And uh, what account aggregator did is to actually facilitate flow of personal data. And what this will do is to is to mediate the flow of aggregate data. And, uh, and, and it uses concepts from differential privacy, from confidential computing, from smart contracts, and brings them together in a very carefully thought out package that will enable a new ecosystem to develop in India, which we think will allow India to become one of the model making countries of the world. So this is very important the DEPA training cycle. Uh, and we are in the middle of doing briefings now. There are pilots happening. Uh, so you'll hear a lot about this uh, in the coming months. Uh, we had also been instrumental in kicking off uh, WANI, Wireless Access Network Interface, which has done very well. It had 100,000 PDOs, uh, but it needed a lot of work uh, to ensure that it will scale further. It will serve the rural communities 
where our mobile operators because of capital constraints are not able to put mobile towers right and so so this has become the last mile delivery uh, for internet for many of our rural communities as i said 100000 pdos are already up and running and we think they'll get into several million over a period of time and uh, so this is something <clears throat> that's going to be uh, brought to life in a big way later this year with drones our early work on drones allowed us to have visual line of sight many drones are thriving uh, the visual line of sight part of the drone industry is starting to do well and it is now time for us to tackle beyond visual uh, line of sight we've been working on this for 2 years uh, this year it will see the light of the day and uh, this will essentially allow transportation to happen over longer distances and uh, so somebody wants to send something from the new airport to the old airport in bangalore you know you can't do it as visual line of sight so you will have to use something like that so there is this whole unmanned uh, traffic management which needs to cater to about 7 million drones you know we have only 700 planes commercial planes so this is a different type type of traffic management that you have to do and uh, many countries are taking uh, different approaches every country has there's no standardization that has emerged there and in india for first principles we have uh, locked down an approach which we will try and bring to life in a big way here in india so and if it works here in india you know it has of course implications for other markets as well uh, <clears throat> on on credit uh, we've been uh, waiting a little for account aggregator to go gain momentum which has now happened it's crossed 5 million consents recently and uh, continues to grow rapidly so this year we think we will be able to make another push for oken and uh, so a big push is coming uh, our pilot with gem has gone well uh, that has given us a lot of confidence that the basic protocol that we have that powers oken is very good uh, and it caters to about four market participants we want to increase that to about seven market participants you'll hear more about this as we go along and 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 um, there's lots of excitement here um the health is uh, you know more complex than anything else that we've done you know the the misaligned incentives uh, are a big problem in health uh, so therefore states like kerala which spend more on health than other states don't get better health outcomes because much of that extra money ends up going in needless cesareans and needless procedures that are not needed so a lot of issues like that are there we have a clear conception of how to solve them and we are going to be kind of continuing to push as we as we go forward so our initial goal was to get the plumbing in place those of you who have seen the health stack open house sessions earlier our goal was the plumbing and the plumbing with abha id with phr with health claims exchange is now in place it's starting to scale up uh, our goal is now to start making more material changes uh, uh, happen and set the playground for that uh, you know in the for the coming years and uh, <clears throat> and of course as i alluded to you earlier there's a lot of effort going on with dpi globalization uh, you know and those conversations uh, are happening Uh, and they will probably continue even after G20 as we go forward. So, if you look at next year, there's lots of stuff coming as well, and that's to do with Sakram. And uh, uh, you know, we haven't announced Sakram in a big way, so I'm not going to do that here. And uh, uh, it's to do with Bharat Distributed Ledger. I think there's a typo under Sakram. It should say something else. It should not say anything at all because it's somewhat of a defensive security. effort that we have which uh, we haven't publicly spoken about but we will in the coming months when uh, sometime towards end of the month and similarly for curation of opinion also there is some work uh, that is happening so so before i end i i wanted to spend a few minutes uh, you know talking a little bit about volunteering itself and and the important point that i wanted to make about volunteering is that look it is very different uh from working in a company and sometimes many of our volunteers come and you know they want to make an impact but they think of doing it in a very corporate kind of a fashion now there is a way to do that if you that, that is what your interest is then there is a way to do that these new type of institutions like dso's and sro's are non profits their 
you can get near market salary, uh, you know, and still make a lot of impact. So, so this middle layer that I spoke to you about a uh, little while back, uh, this layer uh, is a place where you can make a lot of impact. You know, frankly, if you ask me, the best way to make an impact is to actually innovate, you know, as a startup or inside a big company. But uh, the another way to make an impact is to be part of these kind of institutions that are there. Uh, but we are neither. We are a different animal altogether. And we are really focused as a volunteer group, uh, you know, more in the nature of IETF than anything else, as a volunteer group in, uh, in, in, in bringing this ecosystem change, societal change uh, that, that we are talking about. And this volunteering is very hard. It's not only different, it's hard because it's different, but it's actually hard in a different way as well. And uh, the reason is that you operate from influence, you don't have position power, you know, you are talking about, you know, doing something selflessly. It's not about career advancement alone. It's about inner growth, right? And uh, so, so it's not about accomplishments, uh, you know, that you can do in the team, which are important, but it's also about bringing about orbit shifts uh, in, in the broader ecosystem. And uh, so it's very important that you spend some time uh, understanding how volunteering is different. We are going to be always a small set of volunteers. We are never going to be a big volunteer group. And, uh, you know, we want to stay within the Dunbar's limit of about 140, 150 volunteers. We are a little over that right now. Uh, so, so, but we want to be a small set of passionate volunteers, you know, that underpin this deeper change that needs to be brought about in the ecosystem. And we are now approaching it with great confidence because we've had some success, but we also know that we have a long way to go. So, so, so we would love if you want to be part of this, uh, come and try and understand what volunteering is. Uh, we can let you try it out if you like, and uh, uh, and then you know figure it out uh, and see if this is something that you can sustain, or perhaps you know you are better suited to go for one of these other kind of organizations that we talked about. So the remaining part of the open house session will talk a little bit uh, about what else is happening in ice, what is happening in ice spirit, based on what I just described to you. And the way it's been set up is that, uh, you know, pulled extract from some of our internal meetings and strung them together so that, you know, they can provide you additional information as we go forward. So I hope uh, this has been uh, useful. And, uh, and if your heart and head pulls you into this type of volunteering, please reach out to us through our volunteers page. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Gaurav and today I'm going to talk about DEPA training cycle. Let's start with the basic problem we are trying to solve here. As we all know, data is available across various silos and it has sort of its potential is somewhat locked, uh, you know, unless it is shared with each other to unlock its potential. And and what we are going to talk about here is, is can we do exactly that? Can we unlock that potential? Can we allow for data collaboration without uh, compromising on the privacy aspect. Let's get started. So this is the rough uh, outline of the talk and let's get going. So data being the new oil is almost like a cliche now. Uh, we know the data economy is really, really huge, uh, but it is largely dominated by big tech. Indian companies, Indian corporations, particularly Indian startups are largely left out of this opportunity. India is reinventing itself, leapfrogging, as we have seen in UPI and and the you know the data bills taking shape, and we have very large and vibrant data economy. So so uh, so so when we think of data as being the new oil, just think of this just by sheer numbers. India is data rich just because of our sheer numbers. In addition, we are also very diverse, which adds to the the data being able, which adds to the richness of the data. Now. The question is like if we continue with the oil analogy, do we want to be like Saudi Arabia, which controls, uh, you know, its fortune uh, via this new oil, or do we want to be like some other countries where the external governments and corporations come in and, and sort of control and exploit all the richness? Uh, 
so the answer is obvious and 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 through this deeper training cycle what we believe is like we have an opportunity that can un, un, unlock the potential that data potentially has uh, which is right now uh, locked within various silos uh, in the absence of appropriate regulation in the absence of appropriate norms how to share it without risking the privacy uh, and and let's see how we go about doing it so so in this playground uh, there are various stakeholders there is training data provider it can lot of training data providers as i said the data is locked within various silos then there are training data consumers you can think of them as people who need data to create models to participate in this data economy then there are principals and ds principals are the are the individuals or are the agents of individuals whose data we are talking about and discovery agents da's are the, are the agents who help a data consumer discover uh, a, a, you know a potentially useful data source think of it as like a marketplace of sort then then comes sro and tso sro sros are self regulated organizations which sort of regulate themselves right to to make sure that the playground operates as as it should then there are tso's which are technical standard organizations to define and monitor the technical standards to, that define the, the the basic technical infrastructure of 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 this solution that we talk about then the solution is based on something we call a ccr confidential clean room so there are obviously other players like people who provide ccr uh, ccr provider and then people who certify the models to ensure that uh, you know the models don't leak any privacy beyond what is accepted so let's look at it again so right uh, you know you have data principles training data provider confidential clean room that's like our infrastructure that layer we are adding here and training data consumer so and all these are uh, bound by electronic contracts so that they stay within the norms and they and then the underneath them there is a horizontal layer of sros and tso which define how they should operate well without uh, you know breaching any any of the sort of Uh, commitments they have with each other and with the with the people who who oh, the data comes from so so let's continue so let's see how this playground plays out in various phases so in the ccr discovery phase the tdc the data consumer uses sro to understand how how to go about doing it they have to be aware or trained to to start using ccr tdc uses discovery agents to discover the data sets that are relevant for them and then tdc gets synthetic data uh, of 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 their choice from tdps to explore to play around to analyze what the data looks like and if it will be of any value to them then tdc the data consumer iterates on this data synthetic data to build models test hypotheses and see whether it you know whether it is really of value or not then comes the contract phase once tdc realizes that this data is useful to them they get into a contract all this contracting is through electronic contract so that all this can be done uh, virtually you know with very less uh, overhead then tdc tso's help to learn how to how to make sure their their model uh, you know certification works and 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 so that you know the when they send their model to be trained in ccr it, it you know it, it is easy for them to get certified then tdc develops this model the code to that can run on ccr infra which they believe should be able to get certified uh, once it is trained and then uh, you know once they develop it tdc gets it certified and and you know uh, from the model certifier uh, to make sure that they are doing it right then comes the training phase the actual you know the, the meat of the whole uh, whole infrastructure tdc deploys their uh, model that they just built uh, in the ccr Uh, where again the tdp provides the data in the ccr see just imagine like the data never uh, leaves the premises of tdp and reaches the premises of tdc on the other hand both uh, the data goes to ccr and the and the data consumers model code goes to ccr that's where the training happens uh, TC, tdc takes the trained model uh, you know after it has uh, you know sort of done the training it trains on it a few times and once uh, they are happy with it they compensate the ccr and tdp for the for the data and the infra and and then pro probably provide feedback uh, you know with regard to the quality of the data and what worked well what didn't right so so these are the three phases discovery contract and training and let's see how uh, you know 
so it's it's nice like uh, you know how how they play out but let's see what what technology enables this uh, okay before we get there uh, let's see how the money flow happens in this data economy obviously the data consumer which probably is going to benefit from the models they trained using this data so they they sort of are the main sort of uh, you know people uh, main entity which which pays for for this goodness that they receive they have to pay the discovery agent they have to pay obviously the data provider and through data provider they probably you know there is a money flow happening to discovery agents maybe even to data principals and 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 then the infrastructure provider like ccr provider and model certifier these things are still like uh, you know we have not completely thought through these things whether the data goes to data principal or not uh, but but this is roughly how the how the data flow will look money flow will look like uh, let's talk about confidential clean loop that's the technology that enables all this let's take a step back and see how if i were to you know share my data as 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 a data provider with a with a modeler uh, how uh, there there are two things here that that one has to worry about one is uh, the utility of the data when i provide the data it should be useful to the modeler and other is the privacy of the of the people who, you know whose data it is so these are the utility and privacy are like the sort of the two two sides of the coin and and managing them is the hardest part here let's take like historically how we how have we done it uh, maybe we anonymize data so anonymization is great you strip off pii and and the data without any further encryption or any other transformation goes to the data consumer and they do what they do but the challenge is as we all know now anonymization is more like an art and and unless it is carefully done there is a chance that uh, this anonymized data when it sits in the data consumer servers it probably gets joined with many other data sets and there is a possibility that the you know the, the that privacy leakage can happen so while the utility of that data is great uh, for the modeler because there was no transformation on the on the data uh, but the downside is the privacy can be compromised it often does the other extreme is encryption so here the me as a data provider encrypts all the data and then sends it to the data consumer so the assuming the encryption is in the right way there is no risk of privacy leakage here but encryption as we all know it does it it typically will not maintain the patterns available in the data so on the side of the data consumer it typically will not have the utility left to train their models or they have to make significant changes to their modeling paradigms to get any utility out of it so so both these extremes either they overdo the utility part and underdo the privacy part or vice versa so they don't work so what our ccr does is like somewhere get the best of the two worlds uh, and and what it depends on essentially is like the there is this new technology of confidential computing where you even the host server where you run the ccr has no access to the data at no point of time uh, i mean so even if you run the ccr is like a, like a, like a host machine basically right like you spawn a machine in the cloud uh, and and even the host has no way to access the data or the compute that that goes on in the in the in the in the ccr uh, then comes the privacy centricity we use this relatively new concept of differential privacy uh, which allows us to to guarantee privacy from information theoretic point of view and and the beauty of this is like it is not privacy against a certain kinds of attacks we are aware of but it's a theoretical notion of privacy so so it it cards in a way it, it provides mathematical guarantees uh, of you know of of how much privacy is leaked when a model goes out of the ccr irrespective of the attack so so it is not bound by the attacks that we are aware of and 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 dp based model certification is what makes it all happen so so let's again look at it pictorially uh, this is how things are done historically either in anonymized data or encrypted data is tra gets transformed from data provider to data consumer as we discuss anonymization is not good enough for privacy typically and encryption is destroys most of the utility or the patterns available in the data another problem here is the data actually moves from data provider to data consumer so time or purpose limitation of the data may not be enforced uh, by the infrastructure but rather it has to be managed through the regulation it also may lead to resharing again once the data has left 
data provider and it goes to data consumer again through regulatory means you can make sure they, they don't reshare but 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 you know all those are post facto uh, sort of uh, sort of uh, you know detection uh, the problem with transformed or encrypted data is it has lower data utility and and uh, you know the tdc may not be really interested in that what we are suggesting here is more like CCR. The data never goes from data provider to data consumer. In fact, it goes to CCR, where even the host environment doesn't have any access to the data. And and once the training part is done, uh, the CCR, I think of it like it's ephemeral. So maybe CCR itself dis self destructs itself. So, you know, the data comes in CCR, the model code comes in CCR, uh, you know, training happens. Uh, and the model gets certified, and if it is within the within the privacy leakage norms, it goes back to data consumer and CCR, you know, self destructs itself in a way, uh, and and you know, it's like there was no trace of it. So so there is no issue of uh, you know data staring staying with data consumer beyond a certain limit or used for a purpose uh, beyond what it was supposed to or it getting reshared. And another key thing is like in CCR. The, the model code has raw X data and not to the encrypted data, which allows them to run their uh, training pipelines as they have been used to running. Uh, so this uh, sort of uh, concludes our description of, of CCR. And here, uh, this is rough timeline that we are, uh, you know, that we have, you know, plans for in 2023. So the R&D is largely sort of done. Uh, right now, we are in a roadshow sort of mode where we are presenting uh, this concept uh, uh, to to various uh, players in our ecosystem uh, and, and getting their feedback so that, you know, just to plug any holes we have left in, in the whole, uh, whole thinking process. Uh, this will lead us to pilot programs uh, very, very soon. And, and based on the feedback, it takes us to, you know, sort of plan our go to market strategy and hopefully before the end of this year, we will already be talking about, about uh, scaling it so that it becomes more like a new reality uh, than not. And with this, uh, I end this uh, presentation on CCR. Uh, mo many of our volunteers have been working on this, so just look for one who, can, who is able to tell you more about it. Thank you. PM1 is a program for providing last mile internet access based on Wi-Fi across the country. The current state of pm one is that it has around more than one lakh hotspots all across the country. The idea of pm one was conceived in 2016. There was a pilot in which iSpirit was greatly involved in 2017 and it was officially launched by the Prime Minister in 2019 on his Twitter handle. So uh, what is PM Vani all about and what are the, why is it required? Uh, the basic requirement of, uh, of uh, right now is of internet access. How do you access all these services that we are building like UPI, OKEN, ONDC without internet? without internet access uh, available. So this problem of last mile connectivity, uh, which is quite tricky problem is solved, uh, is PM1 could be one of the solutions for solving it. So with, uh, with public, uh, uh, with the digital India push right now, we have the, uh, we have optic fiber cables going to each and every village panchayat office. But then how do, how does it go to the last mile? With PM Vani, how it does it is that it provides an unbundled access, uh, unbundled way of providing internet. So, so far what had been happening is that if a uh, entrepreneur wants to commercially provide internet services, they had to have the technical chops to make sure that they have all the regulatory compliances uh, for providing this kind of internet service, which was quite difficult for uh, a normal, uh, a small entrepreneur. With the unbundling that has happened with PM Vani, what has happened is that uh, the 
the authentication, authorization, and accounting are unbundled. With that, let's let's go into with that in mind. Let's go into the uh, framework entities. So the PD over here is the guy who is going to sell the internet service. Is all he needs to have is just the electrical connection, the internet connection, and a Wi-Fi router which is PM1 compliant. No, no other technical chops required. So once he has this, he can put it up on say in say his shop and start selling internet. Now, who takes care of all the requirements, all the compliances? It's the PDOA. Now, PDOA is a cloud-based uh, is a cloud-based service provider which provides all the authorization accounting services. Uh, through which if there is any liability issue or any malicious activity that needs to be detected by the uh, authorities, by the regulatory authorities, they can go to the PDO and check it out instead of going to the PDO or the hotspot provider. Uh, then there is another entity called the app provider. Now, if you have used public Wi-Fi, authentication uh, is like you have to go and authenticate with every hotspot each time. And that is not a good user experience. So what pm one has done is it has unbundled the authentication layer. So over here, the user needs to download an app. This is a pm one compliant app. Anyone can, uh, uh, can make their app pm one compliant. PM Vani compliance has two basic requirements. One is it should be able to discover the PM Vani compliant hotspots around it. And it has the it has a KYC mechanism, uh, which is basically a OTP-based KYC, and the token created is to be exchanged with the hotspot so that the hotspot knows who is using the internet. And this is done one time, so the user experience is great. The central registry manages the entire ecosystem. It makes sure that the interoperability that we just talked about uh, is maintained. Okay, the, so the interoperability over here means that so a Realtel app should be able to talk to a C dot uh, or a BSNL hotspot and vice versa. We do not want silos over here, which is maintained by the central registry. It also makes sure uh, that the interactions that are happening between the app provider and the PDOA are authenticated. Uh, it keeps a list of public keys for doing that. Uh, let's go further. And this is the user flow. The user flow basically uh, is that the user has to download an pm one compliant app to the OTP-based KYC. He wants to access internet. He will search for the internet uh, or hotspot, or pm one compliant hotspot around it, connect to it. The embedded browser of the app will show the uh, plans available, select the plan, and then access internet. So, the problem, uh, so what is the, uh, how, how does PM Vani compare with uh, the carrier-based last mile connectivity? Well, the carrier-based last mile connectivity requires a lot of capital. Whereas with PM Vani, as I mentioned, it basically just requires a hotspot and uh, an internet connection and uh, electricity connection. But with, with a carrier, uh, tower that has to be installed requires a lot of capital and equipment. Also for last mile connectivity, say if there is no internet uh, or there is no cellular connectivity in my office, I need to call up that guy, ask for a booster device to be placed in my premises, which requires a lot of wiring and equipment, which is again expensive for uh, to be business viable. So in places where the demand is not aggregated, especially in the rural places, 
it's it is it is difficult to be viable uh, apart from that uh, now we have seen that the internet access from cellular providers is not sanitized enough so if you want to get a prepaid connection for internet access the minimum lifetime reach the minimum recharge for validity is around 150 rupees along with which you get 1 gb of internet and if you want more you have to pay more but with pm vani you can get a plain vanilla internet access for a much cheaper cost because it's it's based on a small sachet of internet that the that the uh, service provider would provide the user so what are the challenges with pm vani right now so the pm vani uh, program right now is is going through certain challenges and one of the biggest ones is non compliance of the standard so in a push to just in a push to uh, have more hot spot what has happened is that the compliance part has taken a back seat so a uh, railtel router only talks to a railtel app uh, uh, a railtel app does not talk to a bsnl hot spot so this is creating issues for the eco overall ecosystem the other problem that pm vani is facing right now is a lack of a reference implementation a open source reference implementation which is turning out to be a huge barrier for newer uh, players who want to uh, come up uh, in the ecosystem uh, also pm vani has limited interactions so building new use cases on top of pm vani is becoming difficult the interaction are limited to just the user app and the uh, pdo is for authentication purpose so for pm vani 3.0 we are trying to create a new more open ecosystem which can provide for other use cases like roaming data offloading and so on also while maintaining the quality uh, we would we want to scale up the network now how do we do that is another big question that we are trying to solve in pm vani 3.0 protocol also we are trying to create a governance structure which ensures that the compliance standards are met for pm vani so the two use cases we are focusing on, on for uh, pm vani 3.0 are wifi roaming uh, one of them is wifi roaming so in wifi roaming uh, as as the users basically connect to internet uh, a certain hotspot and pay for a certain plan what happens if they move on to some other hotspot how do they use the same pl plan and carry it forward to the new hotspot uh that is a uh, that is one of the problems that we are trying to solve uh, with pm vani uh so it requires certain it requires certain adjustments and it requires certain new modules to be uh created so we are working on the standards for this these modules especially related to uh pricing and conflict resolution also the public uh, also the next use case that we are working on is public wifi with public wifi what we are trying to do is we are trying to provide a way in which uh say the if the government wants to provide internet access for one hour each day for billa party line citizens how does it provide it so we are trying to create uh, uh enable this kind of sponsored internet access for um uh for users in this framework so this is one of the use cases that we are trying to optimize the framework for 
I'm Amit and I'm here to tell you about the game of drones. Once, there were the three idiots, Rancho, Raju and Remo from Bharat, who wanted to fly and make the world a better place. Rancho wanted to bring better connectivity to his people in the hills and thereby access to medicines and healthcare. Raju, who had grown up on tea estates and had read stories of barnstorming farmers in Australia, wanted to do the same for better produce from the tree gardens. Remo had grown up near the coast and felt that hydroplanes could help transport the fresh catch to larger ports while it was still fresh, thereby getting better pricing for his fishing forks. But alas, they failed to get their pilot licenses and instead of letting their dreams wither away, they invented the drone. The drone could fly and do all sorts of better things to make the world better and that without needing the pilot license. But it turned out that the drone needed to get the Niantrak's approval. Now the Niantrak had only seen planes and had never seen anything like the drone. So he asked the three idiots to propose the basis on which he should approve the drone. The three idiots had never thought on those lines, but could understand that the Niantrak needed to be convinced that the use of drones would not lead to unintended problems for the general public. This meant that they had to understand the potential use cases and draft rules for drone use to ensure that the world did indeed become a better place. So Remo suggested a simple solution, which he said lay in designing a web-based method which followed the procedure for conventional aircraft, that of filing a flight plan, which would then be approved before the flight would be undertaken. Having a web-based portal would make it simple to apply for authorizations and also ensure that only legitimate users got authorizations. A small fee could also be charged to accord authorizations on a first-come, first-served basis. But Raju pointed out that given the traditional delays in granting timely authorizations, many users may no longer want to fly their drones by the time the authorizations were accorded. He also wondered why he should need authorization to fly over his own airspace. Rancho agreed with Raju and pointed out that the system would severely restrict the useful applications of drones. Users with no access to internet may not be able to obtain authorizations. As they discussed, Remo also realized that it would be difficult for local users to compete for approvals from big corporations who would simply book all slots and monopolize the use of drones, thus once again hiking the logistics costs. He also pointed out that different users would be hesitant to share their plans in order to protect business privacy. Rancho pointed out that the information was mandatory, not just for better managing traffic, but also to curb the illegitimate use of drones as well as ensure sufficient information for manned aircraft. Now, this is where Pushpak came in. Pushpak started to understand the needs of the three idiots' arguments and also how the issues could be resolved. We first mapped the various kinds of users and realized that there is a multitude of user needs based on the applications of drones. On one end, you have hobby or family videographers who want to use small, uncomplicated, toy-like drones and mainly for videography, which do not need much airspace. There are farmers or survey users who want slightly bigger drones, but even these drones do not require to fly beyond a couple of kilometers at a stretch. Then there are logistic applications where longer ranges are anticipated. There are also uses for disaster relief or law enforcement where the needs are more complicated, as are the needs for urban air mobility users. The common airspace has to cater for all these users to ensure, and the system design has to ensure public safety, security, and efficiency for all of these users besides for the general public. On deeper review, we realized that the, despite the multitude of users, the users can broadly be categorized into three categories, the visual line of sight, the extended visual line of sight and the beyond visual line of sight. The visual line of sight are essentially small range applications where the control of the drone is primarily by the pilot keeping the drone in his visual contact and here the airspace need is minimal. However, they are expected to be large number of users because such drones are going to be low cost and uh, be used also for hobby purposes. These drones will have low safety impact because they're expected to be small in size at the same time having limited number of safety features. The extended VLOS is where the pilot is assisted by an observer, and this observer in turn is keeping the drone in sight. Here, there is a need to meet the customer needs because all of these have got commercial applications and the traffic volumes are expected to be much higher. However, here also the airspace needs are limited, although the public safety concerns are, are more than that of the hobby flyers. This segment has got significant economic implications. But the real economic implications come in the beyond visual line of sight operations where we can expect the maximum volume of traffic eventually. These would need the highest priority and would have the most complicated airspace needs because they would need to be separated from other traffic through technological means. Therefore, these drones are technologically most potent but would also need to comply with the highest safety standards. With this background, we set about drafting a set of rules for the use of airspace by drones. The first important thing is how to ensure traffic deconfliction wherein we have worked out two strategies, which are also the ones which are largely used by at the global level. 
the first is strategic or reconfliction at the planning stage so there is segregation between drones which are maintained in limited amount of airspace where other manned aircraft are not expected to come and then even more potent drones which are allowed to fly along man side drones and these are termed as remotely piloted aircraft systems at the international level there is also segregation between vlos and dvlos drones by ensuring that vlos drones do not surpass a designated geographical boundary then at the dynamic level there needs to be separation between dvlos drones which would be obtained through flight planning and having on board systems such as detect and avoid in real time tracking the vlos drones which are basically being controlled by the pilot within a certain limited geographical zone of a few hundred meters are the term is geo caged for safety and security we have proposed of course the entire registrations which are already in place through digital sky then remote identification for the micro which is the 2 kg and above category of drones to ensure that they are trackable readily throughout the period of flight also to ensure that the legitimate use going on which is not uh, open to enemy action we want firmware protection which is easy to implement by having it on open standards based this firmware will also have a security switch which will enable the airspace management authority or the utm service provider to activate and restrict the use of the drone on a need basis by ensuring that the drone is then re required to return to home this architecture is all based around the concept of airspace use tokens now the airspace use tokens also fulfill a very important economic aspect which is that of airspace equity the fear that raju had about the big corporations taking away the entire permissions is channeled here through ensuring the different needs of tokens we propose that for vlos of flights there are no tokens or there are lifelong tokens for the evlos flights these tokens are re renewed periodically and the primary aim is to ensure that they have that these drones have not been misused during the period of the token as also to ensure that the security switch architecture is serviceable whereas for the bvlos flights there is a token which is given for each flight and this flight token is issued based on the approval of the flight plan wherein it is ensured that it is not uh, conflicting with other traffic as also based on the charges that the the user is uh, required to pay these charges will be dynamic based on if there is a larger ua or if he wants a particular route or he wants a airspace to be reserved for example that while carrying out filming operations for say covering a sports activity and because these have higher economic value for the user he can afford to pay higher amount of charges with these concepts we have thought of the digital public infrastructure which would bring these concepts to life so for legitimate use we already have put in a, a pretty potent system the digital sky which will have the web based identification of the entire chain right from the drone the manufacturer the pilot or the user uh, etc then we also propose the embedded remote id which would be embedded into the drone at the time of manufacture for all the beyond nano category that is beyond 250 gram drones to help their ready identification there is also the security switch architecture which i already spoke about to enable suitable flight planning detailed dynamic based area maps and route options are planned to be made available because drone flights would also have to be planned over public airspace only and for area applications it would be over private airspace subject to the uh, uh, authorization of the land owner this detailed maps the technology is already available and we expect to be able to provide these detailed maps in time to come the, the traffic information is planned to be anonymized to take care of business privacy pretty much like what you see on google maps where a color code says what is the density of traffic in a particular area as also suggest alternate routes then the next issue is of flight controllers which are the key heart or, or rather the brain of drones so there are concerns that private flight controllers are manipulatable and can be controlled by their original manufacturers especially those of foreign manufacturers so we have been working on open source flight controllers with the aut that is the airspace use token and security switch architecture which can then readily be taken on by indian companies there is also the geo caging feature and because all these would be open standards based it would not have a economic impact in terms of uh, having to develop or the cost of development for the indian manufacturers for traffic management we propose non repudiable auts which are generated automatically subject to fulfillment of the detailed conditions the dynamic pricing algorithms as also the algorithms for uh, declaring the traffic of concern once a aut has been approved and the flight is initiated this essentially means the traffic which can ex be expected to come very close or interfere with the progress of a particular flight so once the problems of how to get the drones in the air and giving them authorizations were resolved the next question which came up the how to cater for the huge number of drones that were anticipated to meet the application demand raju and remo felt that enabling large scale use of drones would generate market demand thereby domestic manufacturing would be encouraged 
However, immediate use of drones also meant that even foreign-made drones would be needed. On the other hand, Rancho wanted to emphasize the security qualities of drones. He felt that approval should be given only for drones manufactured indigenously, and that would help Bharat set up a strong basis for applications and future uses without compromising security. Rancho was right that Niantrak was informed by the Dandapal that Dr. Dang was flooding Bharat's markets with smuggled PGI drones. These drones were threatening Bharat's security and could be used to not only track, but also attack anyone or anywhere. At the same time, news came in that the PGI drones were helping Bharat's economy as they were being used for survey remote parts of Bharat to help build roads as also discover new mines, much like what Raju and Remo had originally proposed. So the Niantrak was in a fix. There was an issue of whether to promote only manufacturing or also allow the drones as a service. Romeo felt that drones should be available cheaply for people to own and use with these compliance requirements. Raju, on the other hand, felt that complicated technology would have significant impact on public safety and should be available only through professional service providers, even if it meant higher costs. Once again, Pushpak proposed a graduated approach. Based on the end use cases, we propose three sets of regulations for the VLOS operations, the EVLOS operations, and the BVLOS operations. The common or VLOS operations can be ensured as not being a safety threat by bringing in the concept of a geo cage. These operations will have a long-term or a lifetime airspace use token, which will just be to ensure that their security switch is serviceable. This, they will require no pilot training and no certification, thereby giving a boost to the low uh, complicated technology in the country. The limited or the medium uh, use uh, EV loss would have an extended geo cage extending to a couple of kilometers with a periodic AUT renewal to ensure that in the period of renewal, there has been no illegitimate use of the drone. There would be limited amount of pilot training, which is easily done through online means, as well as a BI standard based product verification only, thereby reducing the need for complicated certifications. However, the small and above category, which is used for BB loss full spectrum operations, would have to have a flight plan and AUT for each flight. The, the good thing is they would have no geographical limits, only altitude limits to keep them separated from either manned aircraft or the nano micro category of operations. These certified drones would meet specific technical requirements such as detect and avoid, real-time tracking, et cetera. And here, the pilots would need to undergo a formal uh, a training at a remote pilot training organization. So essentially what this provides is a, is a full spectrum wherein the end user can position himself based on his needs for the compliance, making compliance also easier and uh, easily monitored by the regulator. So what is the way ahead that Pushpak proposes for India? There are two critical solutions. One is the concept of graduated regulations, which we just explained. And the major benefits there are that the, the regulatory and security compliances are based on the safety and security needs as also on the, the potential of the uh, threat from that particular category of drones. There's a proportionate cost of compliance providing flexibility to the industry in choosing which level of the compliance matrix they need to fit in. Also, this provides a long-term vision for compliance uh, and provides a, a time for the industry to build its market capacity and come up to the desired level of compliance. The other major issue of the airspace use tokens is essential for airspace management and it optimize, helps optimize the use of airspace. It, it makes the airspace democratic in the sense that there is availability of airspace and if you want, you are required to pay proportionate to the, your use cases. The dynamic pricing will also encourage competition and people will not end up blindly reserving airspace for the future and geofencing enables safe and secure operations from uh, ensuring traffic safety. The timelines for all of this, we propose that a vision statement giving all of this, which is the concept of operations or CONOPS, is published within three months of government approval. This will provide time for industry consultations and industry buy-in. As also, we could propose certain challenge grants to help accelerate the tech development on some of the key concepts. Once the broad consensus has been built in on the concept of graduated regulations, we propose that within a six-month period, we uh, this is notified, especially for the VLOS and EVLOS operations. The notification of the proposed regulations for VLOS and EVLOS will actually make these operations easier than even the regulations existing today. This entire thing will give impetus to the industry and build up market capacity and acceptance, as also provide preparation time for BVLOS and the eventual putting in place of the UTM infrastructure. In about 18 to 24 months, the UTM authority, which will oversee the implementation of the entire UTM infrastructure and rules for BVLOS flights, should be set up. There should be parallel activity for raising the height from the current restriction of 400 feet to 1,000 feet because that would involve significant efforts along with the Airports Authority of India to recarve the airspace of India. But the 1,000 feet band is required to eventually be able to accommodate the entire traffic. 
the detailed area and route maps are required to be published by them. And the concept of airspace use tokens as well as geo cages should be implemented only at that stage, at that point of time. This architecture is pretty much at the leading edge of what the world is proposing, proposing today. In fact, some of these concepts are not recorded in even the European or uh, the uh, uh, American concepts. And our public infrastructure approach can provide a ready uh, playground to be able to, for Indian companies to be expo able to export these technologies uh, to, uh, to at the global scale. And eventually, the technologies for integration of the UTM and the conventional air traffic management can all be coming. So what Pushpak feels is that with this approach, the future of airspace would be coexisting manned and unmanned aircraft, facilitating human activity in all its aspects and making the dreams of not just the three idiots, but of the majority of India coming true. With that. So what, we, what are we trying to solve here with Oken? Currently, there are gaps in our lending ecosystem, which results in most of the MSMEs either staying credit starved or getting access to exorbitantly high cost to informal credit. Even the regulated microfinance system is very rigid. Almost 89% of the MSMEs in India are without access to formal credit. There's a credit gap of 20 to 25 trillion in the MSME sector. This is as per the UK SINA report, which has sown the seeds for Oken. Now, Oken is attempting uh, to solve the credit gap that we just spoke of by introducing a new class of lending, which is cash flow based lending. Everyone is lendable if the tenure and ticket size are correctly considered. This is the motto of Oken. Some of the attributes of cash flow lending that Oken proposes are one, short tenure, which enables a better visibility of SME's business and cash flows, thus reducing the probability of default which a lender may face. Second is a small ticket size, which reduces the magnitude of a probable loss to the lender. Third is purpose specificity, which ensures that the usage of the loan amount is for the stated cause itself. And this reduces the fraudulent or divergent usage of the loan amount. And finally, it's unsecured loans, which enables a huge chunk of SMEs to get access to formal credit by eliminating the need to provide any collateral. Now, we have been at this for a while now. In 2019, the UK SINA MSME report was released. Shortly post that, we started the planning and preparation of Oken for building the right ecosystem. Now, Oken is a big change, a generational change, and hence it needs to be done in phases. And 2023 is going to be a massive year for Oken. In 2021, we started with the first pilot, which was the GEM Sahai pilot, to test whether the hypothesis of a cash flow based lending works for SMEs. Now, we are following this up with the GST Sahai in the phase two, which primarily expands on the borrower segment. With the learnings from GEM and GST pilots, we are aiming to scale Oken uh, in the phase three of this year, where we'll be building a network of participants to solve the credit gap for the unserved and underserved at scale across India. We also have a phase four lined up after that, which will be in September 2023, where we'll be adding credit guarantee and iterating the learnings from phase three. We will now briefly touch upon uh, the phases one and two, share the details and learnings from these phases, and then we'll talk about the changes that we are working on for phase three, where we are essentially scaling the Oken to reach borrowers in rural segments like agri and dairy farmers across India. Government e marketplace, GEM, was our first pilot and it is still an ongoing project with new lenders coming on board. We have had major banks, NBFCs, and lending fintechs participating in this pilot. GEM is the borrower's agent in this case, and the vendors which are registered on this uh, government e marketplace have been the borrowers here. There has been only one credit product in this pilot, which is purchase order driven credit. Underwriting has been using data like the last 90 days transaction history of the vendor on GEM, the seller rating, and the purchase order for which a loan is being taken by the borrower. 
The disbursement also has been uh, extra based in this pilot. And the pilot has been on since May 2021. And we have seen some pretty amazing results that validates our hypothesis on the need for cash flow based products for uh, MSMEs. Here are some of the highlights from the Jansai pilot. The disbursement has been around uh, Indian rupees 15 crore, which has been dis uh, divided over almost 3,700 loans, and 80% of the committed amount has been disbursed in this pilot. The ticket size have been as low as rupees 160 to as high as rupees 10 lakhs, with the average size being around 40,000 rupees. In this pilot, we have enabled unsecured loans at a cheaper interest rates, with average interest rates being at around 16% and uh, with them being as low as 9% here, which is significantly lower compared to the 25% plus uh, interest rates that we have in the informal scenario. The loan performance has also been great. The top three lenders have had an NPA, which is less than 1.5% here. The tenure has been between 55 and 109 days. And the most important thing is the end-to-end -end time, right from the application of the loan till disbursement of the amount in the bank account has been seven minutes, which is a great feat. The key learnings that we have had from this pilot are that we realized that borrower account, a borrower agent role is very critical. In uh, GEMSAI, the borrower agent is government itself, but we will need to account for different borrower's agent as we scale up. The next thing is we started without account aggregator in this pilot and realized the need for an account aggregator to have a seamless consent-based data sharing. Overall, we validated the short-term small ticket loan size does work for everybody in the system, be it the borrower, be it the borrower's agent, or be it the lenders. We now need to test the same hypothesis with the new class of participants and with the account aggregator framework. GSTSI is a second pilot for Okan. The primary change here is the borrower's agent, which is uh, Sidbi in, uh, in the second pilot. And the underwriting is going to be driven by GST data coupled with bank statements. So using GST data and bank data, lenders can get a very clear understanding of the credit profile of the borrower. The data, the combined data will enable the banks to understand the income and the expenses incurred by the SMEs, the concentration risk of the SME by understanding the top 10 customers to whom, with, uh, to whom the SME supplies, it will also help in understanding the regularity with which the SME files the GST data. I'm sorry. And finally, with the input tax credit details, the borrower can have an idea about the overall liquidity position of the SME. Now with account aggregator expected to have the GST data by March of 2023, we expect to include account aggregator as a part of this pilot in few months. But till then, we'll be having SIDB and GST data providers in the ecosystem to supply the GST information about the borrower. Now let's understand how GST Sahai pilot can help the SMEs. Let's take a uh, sample borrower persona. Let's say it's, uh, it's ARA furnishing proprietors, a chair manufacturer who wants to scale his business and hence needs the working capital for the same. Now, traditionally, ARA furnishing would either try and extend their line of credit, which is a cumbersome process, which may require additional collateral, or ARA would have gone to informal sources and got uh, some credit at a very high interest rate. But with GST data and the bank statement data, as we have seen in the last slide, he can get this short-term small ticket loan size, which can help him get the working capital needed to scale his business. We have already onboarded a uh, few lenders for this pilot and we expect to serve custom credit products at an affordable interest rate uh, for such borrowers via SIDB. We, we have seen a good momentum uh, for phase two. Now while uh, phase one and phase two focused on specific borrower types and borrowers agents, with phase three, we will have much broader goals and we'll talk about that in the upcoming slides. 
I'll request Sagar to take over from here. Thank you, Ashish. The two early pilots, GEM and GST, have single borrower visit. It does not capture the complexity and the diversity of the borrower population in India and their needs. During phase three, we aim to target a wider audience and utilize the resources of the local partners by onboarding them in the OKN ecosystem. We anticipate a substantial increase in cash flow based lending products that are customized to meet individual needs. To successfully expand the reach of the OKN ecosystem, it's crucial that we onboard local partners. OKEN till phase two was focused on borrower agents and lenders participating to the network. With phase three, we are expanding the network participants. We are working on non-government borrower agents to expand the reach of the network as well. We will cover some of the technical aspects of OKEN rails in the OKEN 4.0, the newer version of our APIs and the key challenges to architecture over the next few slides. As we scale, our goal is to target the more challenging statements, segments of the unserved and the unserved micro, small and medium enterprises. We are concentrating on several rural areas, specifically in the agriculture and the dairy sector for the April release. By addressing the needs of these borrower groups, we anticipate being able to effectively serve a broader population. Let's examine a private, very day, private dairy value chain as an example and comprehend the need and intricacies to the ecosystem. We will also explore how OKEN facilitates credit-based lending in the sector through collaboration with local partners as borrower agents. In the private dairy value chain, there are three main group of stakeholders, farmers, village dairy entrepreneurs, and processors. Farmers are primary producers of milk and require cash flow for purchasing items such as cattle feed, medical supplies, and milk channels. VDs act as intermediaries in the system aggregating milk from farmers and selling it to private dairies. They also provide cash advances to farmers for necessary expenses. Finally, processors or private dairies handle collection, storage, processing of milk at collection centers. They provide credit to VDs to expand their reach and also offer collection services to VDs that lack chilling or transpiration facilities. Imagine a typical VD, Suresh Patil, and the financial difficulty he faces. Suresh farmers often request for advance payments for, for cash flow. As Suresh does not own a bulk milk chilling unit, he delivers milk every day. The dairy has a payment cycle of 10 days. So Suresh is paid every 10 to 12 days after paying a significant sum as advance to onboard the farmer. If he wants to expand his operations or get better margins, his main option would be to obtain credit from informal sources or microfinance institutions with increased interest rates up to 20%. Providing credit to Suresh can be challenging. He operates with multiple sole proprietorship firms, making it difficult to establish a credit history. Furthermore, formal invoices of supply are generated only once per cycle, and handwritten notes, also known as Parchi or Pauti, are issued with every collection, making it hard for Suresh to demonstrate credit worthiness. This lack of options available for Suresh makes it a lender centric market. Going back to what we mentioned earlier, OKEN 4.0 will follow local partners and distant lenders philosophy. OKEN aims to onboard public and private borrower agents that are already active in various sectors, starting from the dairy sector. This will help reach and serve borrowers at a grassroots level. OKEN will help underwriting lenders by enabling access to historical data about VD's milk collection through dairy records with their consent. The payment numbers can be validated by the lender from the VD's bank account via the account aggregator framework like we did it in GST and GEM. This will enable lenders to come in as participants in the ecosystem, create custom products with the help of local, local agents and address the need of similar to the dairy sector. Let's also briefly look at the agri sector. Consider a farmer, Ram Prasad Verma. He's a small farmer with two hectares of land holding. He picks crops basis advice from neighbors and needs credit for each crop cycle at regular intervals. The challenges that he faces, the current umbrella of lending products, unpredictable weather, his own mindset, market access, and pricing. His needs. Crops are seasonal. Credit needs to align to the harvest season and at regular intervals. Address the complexity basis, the crop production and regional requirements. For example, 
if there is a delay in the rainfall, the credit payment needs to be adjusted and is also difficult to do this with a longer tenure product. How OKN will help? Lenders and borrower agents have a clearer idea about the regional requirements, business, and the cash flow requirements. The borrower agents create custom product to meet the meet his cash and tenure needs. The collection and disbursements are controlled for purpose-driven lending. The credit guarantee is provided to the lenders to ensure their loans. Okay, in 4.0, we are taking a techno-legal regulation to help address the digital lending regulation. The RBI faces several issues with digital lending in India. The first one being lack of oversight. Digital lending platforms are not currently regulated by RBI, which makes it difficult for the central bank to monitor and control their activities. Lack of transparency and standardization. Digital lending platforms have varying levels of transparency, and there is a lack of standardization in the way they operate, which makes it very difficult for borrowers to compare and choose the best loan options high interest rate and predatory lending practices. Some of the digital lending platforms charge high interest rates, which can be predatory and trap borrowers in a cycle of debt. With real-time view of network activity, the regulator can better manage and control the network. We are working with credit guarantees as a part of the OKN framework to provide comfort to the lenders. Some of the issues that OKN will help improve with credit guarantee schemes. Reducing the complexity in the application process, increase accessibility, improvement in monitoring and enforcement with the techno legal approach built into the core of OKN framework. It should be noted that discussions regarding this matter are currently in infancy and will be addressed at a later stage following the current phase. The OKN 4.0 walkthrough. The next release, we are introducing two major components as a part of the OKN framework, the product and the participant registries. This is an addition to the OKN APIs. The goal of these two components is to provide collaboration and discovery mechanism. The products created by lenders will be listed on the product registry. Onboarding of participants will happen in the participant registry. Once the product is created by the lender, the local participants can subscribe to the product and list them on their respect respective properties. SROs will provide guardrails against bad actors in the system. We are introducing new features to the lending system to enable cash flow lending, including a digital workflow for disbursement, purpose controlled loan products, and an automated repayment through UPIE mandates and escrow mechanism. Additionally, we will have an online dispute resolution system in place for customers and market participants. <laughs>